everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Roald Dahl Retrospective, where we take a look at adaptations based off of Roald Dahl shorts and books. I am Patricia. My name is Aaron. And uh, back with us is Eli, a.k.a. the Hero of Tomorrow. Welcome back, Eli. Good to be back. So last time we discussed about the 2015 BBC TV movie, SEO Trot. So this time around, we're going to be discussing about another TV movie from the BBC. We're going to be talking about the 2016 two-part TV movie, Revolting Rhymes, which is based off of the 1982 book of the same name. So I wouldn't say it's uh, much of a... I mean, when they say it's a TV movie, obviously it's uh, developed into two parts. So overall, it's an hour, basically. So that was makes it a TV movie. But really, it's kind of like, uh, if anything, it's a BBC special that's uh, divided up into two half hours. So. Yeah. And, and for some reason, I don't know why, but the Oscars nominated it as a short film, which I guess it's true, but this was back when they decided to do part one as opposed to part one and part two, even though that they aired a day apart. But Revolty Rhymes did not win that Oscar. The one who actually won was Dear Basketball. If you remember, that was the Kobe Bryant short mm -hmm. that um, originally got so much controversy. It's like, oh, really? A Kobe Bryant short about him playing basketball won the Oscars? But I think now with 2020, I think they're thinking about it a lot differently. Yeah, I just think uh, with um, also something as well, like uh, BBC uh, is um, obviously covenanted with uh, great, uh, you know, uh, stop, anima stop motion and also 3D animated shorts as well. And like, uh, let's not uh, forget, it's pretty much the place where uh, Wallace and Gromit got its uh, got its start, and uh, then eventually like uh, various other um, uh, properties, and uh, including Shaun the Sheep, and uh, you know, Ardman basically kind of like made their name pretty much uh, um, going over the BBC, and then obviously that rolled on to various other uh, artworks and uh, this is just uh, once again uh, another uh, another classic uh, I think to add to the collection of uh, BBC's archive yeah even though that the BBC did distributed it it was animated by two animation studios one was magic like pictures which is located in Berlin Germany and the other one was triggerfish animation studios which is located in Cape Town South Africa so this is actually a really interesting movie because out of all of the animated adaptations based off of a Roald Dahl book, this is, as of right now, the only 3D animated film because the BFG and, well, another one we'll talk about next month was done in 2D, while James and the Giant Peach and Fantastic Mr. Fox was done in stop motion. So this is a very unique one, and you can definitely tell when looking at this movie the illustrations was done by Quentin Blake. And uh, by the way, anyone who's saying that, oh, wait a second, what about the B what about the newer BFGs? Like, no, we reviewed the 1980s version, not the newest one. So. Well, yeah, and that, and also the newest BFG that was a live action film. So not to be confused with the two. Well, it had 3D animate, you know, animation in it. So like, uh, you know, I guess so. But what I'm talking, I guess, yeah, I guess you you do have a point. Sure. If you go, if you guys recall, a few months ago, we did talk about an adaptation of. Uh, revolting rhymes in the form of Roald Dahl's Little Red Riding Hood. So uh, is this one better than the one that came out in 1995? So uh, let's get started. Here we go. Unlike Roald Dahl's Little Red Riding Hood, in which they just chose one story, they decided to do five out of the six of the short stories that were featured in Revolting Rhymes. So for those who uh, are not familiar with Revolting Rhymes, and also since it's been a while since we did discuss about Roald Dahl's Little Red Riding Hood. So back in 82, Roald Dahl had written a book called Revolting Rhymes, which was essentially new takes on classic fairy tales. And the fairy tales were Snow White, and Little Red Riding Hood, Jack and the Beanstalk, Cinderella, The Three Little Pigs, and Goldilocks and the Three Bears. The only exception that was not featured in the 2016 film was Goldilocks and the Three Bears. 
And a good majority of it was, uh, you know, like split off into multiple um, chapters in this, um, you know, TV movie, switching between the different stories. But the main focus from the looks of it is, you know, centering around, I guess, maybe a combination of like Little Red Riding Hood and a, and a bit of Snow White with everything else kind of mixed together. So I guess we can get started with the plot. So it starts off with a woman named Mrs. Hunt who enters into a diner. And um, then comes in the wolf who is like looking at her and basically telling the story about his two nephews named Rex and Rolf and how each of them became the wolf in the respected classic fairy tales. Uh, one of them became the wolf for Little Red Riding Hood and the other one became the wolf for the Three Little Pigs. And we get to see from his perspective on telling the the bleaker, darker side of fairy tales, kind of like with um, how the Brothers Grimm and various other writers told us, you know, fairy tales in a very dark way. Yeah, right, right off the bat, it kind of, I just had this really crazy thought. I mean, uh, do you think this is like uh, the what what um, Avengers Endgame was to the Brothers Grimm? <laughs> when you really think about it, like uh, here's all these worlds that just comes together for this like movie. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sort yeah, of. yeah, sort of, yeah. I mean, it's essentially like you have these five fairy tales, and they come together into one, and. There are some that are a little bit more focused than others, and I think that it's pretty interesting considering that um, in this universe we have like all of these characters and their portrayals are vastly different than you would expect in the classic fairy tales. As mentioned in Roald Dahl's Little Red Riding Hood, Red, um, you know, she does have the scene in which you know she shoots the wolf with the pistol and then she makes a fur coat out of him. Uh, but here, it actually tells more of it in which she shoots the second wolf from the three little pigs, and then she kills off the pig from the three little pigs because he's a banker, and he essentially decided to invest his money on the two uh, little pigs who are building their house out of sticks and straw, and it didn't go very well because the second wolf immediately ate them as soon as they were going to start building their houses. Yeah. Before we start going any further, I mean, uh, in this movie that we're talking about, they actually uh, talk about how, well, they actually show how uh, Red Riding Hood actually got, you know, acquired the gun. You know, like, uh, if you remember in the in the original Rolls and Grimes, she, he just, uh, Rolls and Grimes wrote so that uh, she just pulled a gun out and shot him. You know, in this, they actually say that, oh, she got the gun from the Huntsman. Exactly, yeah. yeah. The same huntsman that was featured in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs in which the stepmother became really jealous of Snow White's beauty and so she decided to hire the huntsman to kill her. And then when Red was trying to save uh, Snow White, that's when the pistol fell off and then that's what she's been using throughout the course of the first half of the movie. And by the way, they actually didn't actually show like the wolves getting shot. They basically just kind of like cut away and like just uh, then it says shown in narration by the wolves, like you know, oh yeah, they you know you took one shot and then all of a sudden they're dead on the floor. So yeah, so I guess we should look at it in two separate parts because that's how the movie was structured. So part one, it focuses on the wolf telling Mrs. Hunt the story about what happened to his two nephews, and it shows off of uh, Snow White and Little Red Riding Hood as children, where Snow White had lost her mother and. Little Red Riding Hood is selling flowers, almost akin to something that you see in the the Match Girl, and then you have, um, uh, you know, basically it goes like you know back and forth between like the Wolf's perspective, Snow White's perspective, and um, Little Red Riding Hood's perspective. And I, I have to say that um, this the the friendship between uh, Snow White and Red are pretty adorable. I mean, you see them as children, and they're really close because. You know, they've went through so much, especially with, um, you know, Snow White losing her mother and she's all alone and Red comes along and, you know, befriends her. And then, you know, they start, you know, they grew up together and they start becoming really close until that was the day that the husband took her away. And then Red starts developing a stronger personality when the grandma was being eaten by the wolf. And then, you know, he she shot the wolf and then made him into a fur coat and then... Her personality just becomes a lot more stronger and more confident as the first half continues. So I wasn't paying attention, but what happened to the king? Like, we saw him, like, in the beginning, and then after that, I don't think we saw him again. Yeah, that's kind of weird, because, you know, you have the king who's, like, crying, saying, I'm going to find myself a second wife, and then... You have the introduction of Mrs. Manglehose, and she's like the evil stepmother. It's like, you know, I, I mean, like, in, if you remember that in the first, like, at the end of the first half, you see the king, like, holding on to a bunch of women while he's falling asleep on the floor for 
reasons. And then the stepmother is like falling asleep on the bed. So it was like, what it, it did the stepmother take control of the bed. And then the King was like, Oh, I have to sleep on the floor. And then I'm going to sleep around with my maidens. What? I, mean, I don't mean, know. Yeah. It just, it feels like uh, one thing, uh, I, which is, uh, uh, I'm a bit disappointed at is that uh, unfortunately there are some like loose ends that this uh, special does leave open, but uh, and decides to like tie up other ones, which is kind of like uh, okay, you know, great you tied up that one, but uh, do you want to address this one for me, please? Kind of like mm. uh, yeah, so it's it, it feels a little bit unfinished when you really look at it. Yeah, the thing is, unlike the book, which was a series of unconnected stories, the the special tries to to tie a lot of them together into one big narrative. In movie form, the idea works well, but it's still not a perfect connection. <laughs> yeah. No, it's not because I mean, as, I mean, I would say, in my personal opinion, I actually liked the first half more than the second half. It's not because it has a lot less shorter stories in which, like, oh, um, you know, the the, the two story, the two stories we're going to focus on is Jack and the Beanstalk and Cinderella, which it does make con it makes sense in the story because in the second half, this is when the wolf comes into um, the house uh, where Little Riding Hood's children are living in, and you know he's trying to take revenge on Red because she killed his nephews and so he wants to do the same thing in which he wants to eat you know her children but along the way the daughter is like no you have to read us two stories as opposed to one um so then he starts reading the stories about jack and the beanstalk and with cinderella and, and then here's the thing in the first half when the stories are being told it, it it's actually connected in that universe but in the second half, it's like, oh, they're just stories. I mean, even though it does take place in the same town, in the same location, we never get to see the real, um, you know, Jack and the Beanstalk or Cinderella interacting with, you know, Little Red Riding Hood or Snow White or any of those things. It's just part of the story. And I think that what makes it interesting is that I feel like, you know, the wolf's, um, you know, motivation I mean, it does make a lot of sense if you look into the first half, but then in the second half, when he starts connecting with the children and reading the stories, it's like, you know, at what point did he, it was he like, you know what, I'm just going to spare these kids and I'm just going to leave them back, leave them as that. It's yeah, like, I, I was surprised when that happened too, because I know that Roald Dahl is, is kind of known for his cruel twist endings in his children's book. I mean, I mean, usually it happens to the characters that deserve it, like, the twits ended with the two characters standing on their heads and then basically dying as they melt into their bodies. But I, I am glad that the wolf spared the kids, obviously. But I think that his character, but I think that his redemption arc was a little bit rushed. Mm. Also, yeah, it, it was just kind of like uh, I mean, it would have been nice if they probably like had a couple of minutes of dialogue between the wolf and Red and like have him explain like why he decided not to do it. Like, you know, like, uh, maybe he just said, oh, hey, you know, uh, and actually, in some of that as well, wouldn't it have been, like, does, wouldn't it have been, like, uh, been better if the kids had given him a reason not to, like, eat them, if anything like that, you know, like, uh, just uh, say, oh, um, you know, this is what, you know, maybe make it a generational thing, maybe, like, just say, you know, oh, this, this was what happened before, but, you know, the only way we're going to move forward is, uh, I know it sounds stupid, but, uh, maybe, you know, let them give him a reason to kind of, like, move forward from, like, and just accept that, you know, the past is the past and they need to move on. And maybe the wolf learns from, from something from that. I don't know. Just, just Yeah, it, it kind of like, it kind of like sounds how we wish that this relationship between the Grand High Witch and Luke's grandmother would have been a lot stronger had they interacted a lot more. It would have been nice if we would have seen the wolf and Little Red Riding Hood meeting together all these years later with the children. And, you know, maybe, you know, Red was saying like, uh, you know, I had to do it because I had to defend, you know, the fact that my grandmother was eaten by your nephew. And then the second one was, well, I mean, hey, you, you I mean, your other nephew was about to blow up a bank with a pig in it because he wanted to eat him. So it's like I had to do what I had to do. So, yeah, it would have been nice if we would have gotten a deeper explanation on, you know, what made the wolf decide to change his mind, especially since, you know, his redemption, you know, his revenge does sound pretty sound. I mean, Little Red Riding Hood killed his only family. And not only that, but made them into fur coats. That is another major slap in the face. Yeah. Also, insert the wolf among us joke here. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think they needed some more explanation on that, I think, uh, in, in regards to that. Because basically all it just said is, like, uh, hi, Red, bye. And then that's the end of the movie, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. 
So I think that with the story structure, I think that it's it's really interesting. I mean, I'm glad that they were able to stick pretty close to the original rhymes. I mean, how the fact that they were able to make it flow consistently throughout each of the different stories, even though that they are con they're, they have no connection whatsoever. Like I like the fact that in Jack and the Beanstalk and Cinderella, they were next door neighbors, and then they ended up together with. Um, you know, the the story with uh, Cinderella that she married a simple jam maker. That jam maker just so happened to be Jack because he saw that Cinderella wanted jam when the evil stepsister threw her the bread. And uh, she saw, uh, you know, she saw the opportunity to take some jam so she could have it with the bread. And then Jack was, you know, seeing that, oh, you know, she wanted, some, you know, some jam with her bread because it would make it taste really good. And so when he opened up the, um, the jam, uh, you know, short, um, the jam shop, um, you know, after he got like the billions of dollars that he got from t taking the giant's, uh, you know, golden leaves, you know, that's when he decided, oh, I'm going to name one of the jams after Cinderella. And I just like the fact that they were not able to hold any punches with this adaptation. Like they were able to, you know, put in the scenes in which when the prince from Cinderella cut off the, the you know, the, the stepsister's heads or Little Red Riding Hood you know, shooting the wolves and the pigs with a gun and then making them into fur coats and the, the pig, uh, the pig uh, purse respectively. I mean, they could have easily like said, okay, we need to tone it down for like the little kids because maybe they would, it would scare them. Uh, Although admittedly no. the one, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Although admittedly the one thing that they did drop and I can understand was that, you know, that one line from the Cinderella um, revolting rhyme story about how the prince said like you know go after that nut uh which was in the um in the movie well in the original revolting rhymes was go after that slut so obviously they had to cut that part off because mm. you know obviously but um yeah i think that for the most part when it comes to the connectivity between the stories it, it did a pretty good job i mean you know it was able to actually flow consistently it was interesting throughout and you know none of the parts dragged or become boring like in you know roll doll's little red riding hood in which like the narrator was you know talking for 15 minutes that had absolutely nothing to do with the story and then it just constantly wasted time with pointless filler so at least the story felt very, it was pa fast paced and, and that was a detriment to some parts of the story, but at least it was intriguing enough to sit through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, now, in one story, I guess we could say that uh, the um, the prince uh, uh, busted it up by chopping a nut. I don't know. <laughs> that was all yeah, right. I, I know. apologize. But... No, it's okay. But uh, the one thing that I have to say is that I really like the the little touches that they did with the animation when it came to the storytelling about you know, that one little scene in which when the pig was, uh, you know, bringing Little Red Riding Hood into his secret little, um, you know, com uh, little lair behind the bank. And you saw like him turning on the fireplace and the fireplace, you know, the fire flames look like it was made out of paper, which I thought that was a really nice touch considering that this is actually a storybook. And, you know, there was also, like, little touches with the animation as well in which, like, some things looked like they were made out of paper or some things, um, you know, kind of, like, stuck out, kind of like a pop-up book, which I thought that that was a really nice touch. And the animation... Now, here's the thing. I know that we've criticized Quentin Blake's style of narration, uh, of drawing in the past, uh, that, you know, it's it's very sketchy and, you know, it, you know I, I, some people call it, it's like, oh, you know, I can draw better than that and I suck at drawing, but... I think with the style that they went with, and especially with the 3D animation, I think it works here. Yeah, I will say one thing that did kind of stick out for me about this movie is the way the human characters were designed. The human characters in this movie look like, look like they came out of the Adult Swim show moral or whole to me. Oh, wow. Uh, I can see that. I, I, I've not watched enough more oral to kind of like uh, draw correlations. Uh, it was really nice, though, to, uh, to look at. And uh, I think uh, it looked to me look more like... I mean, that's the thing as well. Like, uh, it could have easily looked uh, pretty cheap if they decided to, like, you know, not put enough uh, thought into the, into the character designs. Like, uh, I've seen that done too many times in 3D animated movies. Yeah. And I have to say, with the voice cast, it was done pretty well. You have Dominic West as the wolf, and... Um, you have Rob uh, Bryden as the king and the banker pig. Uh, Rose Leslie as Little Red Riding Hood was probably my favorite uh, because 
you know, she was able to play off the the sad and kind of timid character, but then she started growing as a character when she starts killing off the the two wolves and the pig for cheaping on her money. Uh, but, you know, shout out to Rose Leslie. Uh, you know, she uh, played as Gwen Dawson in uh, Downton Abbey and uh, Ygritte in Game of Thrones. And, um, you know, she, she was done pretty well in her portrayal. And Gemma Chang as Snow White... Um, I have to say that with the wolf's narration, I mean, the wolf, you know, the wolf's voice and presence is very, very good. But I have to say when compared to the last narrator that we talked about with uh, James Corden and SEO Trot, I think in my opinion, I still think that James Corden is the best narrator we've seen so far. Um, well, I would make the argument it's kind of unfair to compare the two because you've got uh, two conflicting uh, narratives. You've got uh, James Gordon telling the delightful tale of how, you know, um, uh, um, these two old uh, you know couple got together. Pretty much, and so and then you also got the twists and turns of that as well, which uh, made it all whimsical. And then obviously you got uh, kind of like the the, the dark, um, you know, telling of these uh, these fairy tales, which is uh, d you know done by this narrator in this movie. So I think uh, I don't know. I think it's a bit unfair to compare the two in some way. Well, the, here's the thing: I'm not comparing it with the, per the with the performance. I'm comparing it to how they fit in the story. Like, here's the thing: like I can understand of you know the wolf knowing about what happened to his nephews. That I understand. But then how did he know about the details with what happened to Snow White and with Little Red Riding Hood as soon as, you know, they were done with their lives? Like, how did he know about that from reading in the papers or, you know, like uh, listening in the radio stations or something like that? Now, I can understand the second half. He's actually reading the book to the children. But as for the first half, how did he know about the details of what happened to their lives? Well, I think I think it just goes back to the original yeah. complaints about the uh, about the movie. The fact is that, uh, you know, they tied up some ends but not tied up others. Well, apparently the wolf in this movie is like a master of disguise. So for all we know, he was spying on them their whole lives. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a possibility. I just wish that we would have actually gotten to see a little glimpse of that. Like I, the one touch that I really did like was the scene in which when Snow White decided to grab the magic mirror from her stepmother and bring it back with the seven dwarves. The, the person that she got the ride from in the motorcycle was the fairy. And the fairy is not in the first half. She's in the second half. So it would have been really nice if maybe like every once in a while we do get to see the wolf in like a trench coat and, you know, spying on the, you know, uh, spying on Red and Snow White to see what they were up to. I think that that would have made it, you know, tie a little bit better. Yeah. So basically he's our G-man in all of this. <laughs> yes, he is, the, he is the G-man. Yeah. Rise yeah. and shine, Red Riding Hood. Rise and shine. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, I think that with um, the the way that they were able to tell the you know each part of the story, um, I, it does it really well with the you know how it connects. And I think that uh, with you know Dominic West's portrayal as the wolf, it just really lures you in. It's like you want to know what happens next. I mean, and that's the one thing that I can say that that I can consider to be even way more superior than Roald Dahl's Little Red Riding Hood. I'm, I'm just gonna flat out and say it. If you're going to see an adaptation of Roald Dahl's, you know, uh, in, uh, Roald Dahl's Revolting Rhymes, then watch this movie. Don't watch Roald Dahl's Little Red Riding Hood. I just watched it recently to get myself prepared, and it's actually worse than I remember. Yeah, I was just, like, around the 20-minute mark, I was just bored. And then it just, like, went all over the place in that scene in which I was mentioning about, like, um, you know, Wolfie being trapped in the 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 thunderstorm for like 10 minutes and that had nothing to do with the story so i mean you know no disrespect to people like the late ian holm or julie walters or danny devito but still just that movie just bored me i i think i mean i i understand that the risk that they took in which like they needed to adapt a play into a 45 minute bbc special but man like I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I would say that it, while it may not be as bad as Four Rooms, I still think that that's the worst movie we've seen so far. But it is definitely up there in terms of Danny, the champion of the world and breaking point in the in the fact that it's just so boring and it just drags on. So I would say that out of the two, this one is definitely um, revolt. The 2016 revolting rhymes is way better. It's, it does have its problems when it comes to story structure, knowing that these are short stories that they had to compile into one movie, but you know what? They pulled it off better than I thought that they would. 
And, uh, you know, like, uh, in regards to the presentation, I mean, I think it's, uh, I, I like it. And, uh, you know, the music's great, the sound's great, uh, the voice actors, I think, uh, I can't fault. You know, I think, uh, I think well, even though there's uh, some, you know, uh, story uh, inaccuracies in uh, some, pl some places, I think uh, this is a good adaptation, I think, of a Roald Dahl story. Yeah, I do think so. Now, as you guys know, next time we will be talking about another animated film, but let's just toss that aside for the moment and let's talk about the movies that we have talked about in terms of the animated adaptation. So um, c comparing like the BFG, James and the Giant Peach, and um, well, I guess the other BFG, if you want to count that as an animated film, sure. But And then there's Fantastic Mr. Fox. How would you say that this movie would rank up there with the others? Well, uh, unfortunately, there's one movie that stands out because it was actually approved by Roald Dahl himself, and that was the 1980s BFG. So, I yeah. mean, uh, I would say that out of all of them, that basically gets the seal of approval, and I would say probably is uh, the probably the top one for me. Not only the fact that it was made by Cosgrove Hall, but, uh, you know, here's the thing about this. Like, I'm not one to shy away from new talent, and uh, I think what we've got here in regards to the revolting rhymes, you can actually say that some effort and some passion was put into the project, and the fact that they managed to uh, do this uh, through two studios, I think, uh, is uh, a heck of an achievement. I think uh, not not just for the BBC, but I think for any uh, production company, as far as I'm concerned. So you know, I think uh, kudos in uh, producing something that uh, I think we'll be talking about. I think for a very long time. Mm -hmm. It might be a little hard to judge for me because I don't have the nostalgic connection to this that I have to James and the Giant Peach. In fact, I didn't even know this uh, that revolting that the revolting rhymes adaptation existed until Patricia told me about it. I watched it shortly after after she told me though. Yeah, I'd be inclined to agree. I think the BFG is probably the best one so far. I do really like James on the Giant Peach. Revolting Rhymes and Fantastic Mr. Fox, deciding where they go is a bit harder. I do really like the animation in Fantastic Mr. Fox more than I like the one, the stuff in Revolting Rhymes, even though both are good. I think my, I think my only complaint about James and the Giant Peach is that they basically uh, pad in Randy Newman as far as mu as much as they possibly could, and uh, to the point where you basically have just unnecessary song numbers at this yeah. point. Uh, it, you have to understand, Aaron. It was the '90s, so these kind of song numbers, even though that they were not necessary to the story, it was kind of a common thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as for me, now here's the thing. Now. Um, Similar to what you were saying about like, oh, I didn't know until of the of this adaptation that until I told uh, until I told you about it. I felt the same way about the BFG. I didn't know about the BFG until Aaron told me about it. It's like, oh, you know, this is uh, one that I really love, and this is one that Roald Dahl himself approved of. So I had no nostalgia connection to it. Oh, by the way, uh, for all the fans who are fans of the 1980s BFG, the soundtrack is now on Spotify. Nice. Huh. Oh, so sometimes secretly is like my favorite, you know, uh, uh, movie song, pretty much, you know, uh, with exceptions, obviously. But uh, you know, now that I've got that in my in my uh, in my playlist, yeah, it's uh, that's wonderful. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, I had no nostalgia connections to the BFG. So when going into the first time with fresh eyes. Um, I saw that there was a lot of love and passion into it. I mean, it was like the little animation studio that could. They were not Disney. They were not Warner Brothers. They weren't Ralph Bakshi. They weren't Don Bluth. They were known for Danger Mouse and Count Duckula. They decided to do a theatrical movie. And you can see that they put in a lot of work into it. And it was one that Roald Dahl was, you know, personally really happy with. Yeah. But, I think, you know, know, on top of that as well, I think it was, uh, I mean, let's face it. Um, who was doing pretty badly before the Renaissance era at that point? I, Disney. Disney, exactly. So I think Cosgrove Hall probably took a look, look at that and thought, hey, you know, uh, what if we could put in our own spin on, uh, you know, the uh, the fantasy, you know, animated feature and uh, potentially, you know, um, get our notoriety out there and be known for more than just Danger Mouse and uh, everything like that, everything else that Cosgrove Hall has done. And, uh, you know, it was um, it was it was a fair gamble for them to, to do because, you know, unfortunately then Disney kind of upped their game after that. I think uh, The Little Mermaid it obviously blew everyone out of the water, but uh, you know, so to speak. But uh, you know, it's just it's uh, you can't fault them for them to uh, try and uh, put put us together. And on top of that, as well, a pretty ballsy move to like uh, approach Roald Dahl as well, given the fact that he was still had the, the bad taste in the, his mouth from uh, you know the uh, w you know Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. So yeah, exactly. And 
you know, looking into this movie for the first time, I was like, oh, wow, this this reminded me of the um, the Rankin Bass fantasy films from the 70s, like um, Flight of the Dragons or, the you know, Little, um, you know, The Last Unicorn or The Hobbit. So it, it definitely put me in a familiar ground when watching the movie. It, it felt like it was a very similar atmosphere. So, you know, going into, you know, before this, you know, um, I would say that my favorite adaptation, I mean, animated adaptation was Fantastic Mr. Fox, because I saw the movie twice in theaters. I um, got the movie on DVD. I introduced it to my sister and she absolutely loved it. I mean, we would quote the lines and all that kind of stuff. So I would say that, you know, out of that, I would say that that was the best because I felt that, you know, the stop motion was fantastic. I love the dialogue, uh, you know, kudos for... Wes Anderson and the cast and crew and the the, de the details that they were able to put in, like the fact that they were able to record in real time outside and in various places. But yeah, the BFG, I would say comes at a pretty close second because here's, and, and once again, you know, this is somebody who had never seen it until just recently. So I saw that they were able to not only do the book justice, but they were able to put in some wonderful performances so with the likes of the BFG and Sophie and the, the Queen of England and the, the Giants. So, and, and the, you know, the, just the soundtrack was good. The animation was good. So yeah, as for where I would put Revolting Rhymes, that's very hard to say. Do I put this above James and the Giant Peach? I mean, I did have my issues with James and the Giant Peach, but James and the Giant Peach at least was a complete story. It wasn't like a bunch of shorts cobbled together into one. So I still am on the fence on which one I prefer. So I would say it's kind of like bordering between the two. And, and then, well, the one we're going to be talking about next time, let's be honest, that is like, bottom of the barrel dumpster fire trash <laughs> so yeah yeah we're we're waiting that one Ooh. anyway so let's give our final thoughts yeah um so final thoughts on revolting rhymes um i was seeing variations uh, of uh, and also by the way we should mention this as well so there was the book itself there was also the uh, the audio book that also was also done as well, and also there was uh, the original, actually uh, uh, animated, uh, you know, uh, well you could say animated, quote unquote, um, version from uh, I, can't remember, I think it was AHE and Tempo Video, the people who had the distribution rights for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. They actually brought out their yeah. own version of that, which had Bruna Scales, which, uh, as you all know, is a Mrs. Faulty from Faulty Towers. So that's uh, right. Yes. Yeah. So it, it, I, I actually looked at the video that you uh, linked me. It's like, is this the Revolting Rhymes? I'm like, no. <laughs> uh, and it turned out, oh, this is actually was a series of like VHS tapes that, you know, actually had the Quentin Blake style of drawing and it had Pernula Scales doing the narration for a lot of them. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. I never had this as a kid. So I, this is kind of new to me. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I'll tell you what, uh, babe, you know, uh, um, by the way, somewhere down the line, uh, Patricia is going to come to the United Kingdom to, uh, to come see me. And so I think I'll have to introduce her to my VHS collection that we got in my parents' house. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, uh, you, you showed me that picture of Roger Rabbit and you were like, I watched this movie a million times as a kid and I almost wore the VH tape, VHS tape out. <laughs> like, uh, you know, like, yeah, there's like, there's just, uh, we've got this whole collection of like, just of our childhood, everything we just put in the video cassette recorder of just what we watched at the time. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. So, uh, Eli, final thoughts. I would agree with you that uh, that this adaptation is probably the best version of this story of the best adaptation of this particular story that exists. And you brought up the the witches movie earlier, and well, here's hoping the remake will be better. But oh, that will be very interesting. I saw the trailer, and. It, it interested me. It's like, okay, we have Chris Rock as the narrator. So we have another narrator to, you know, to see which one is the best one so far. And uh, it takes place in 1960s Alabama with an African-American cast and Anne Hathaway is the Grand High Witch. I'm kind of intrigued. And it's actually, you know, it's done by Robert Zemeckis and uh, Guillermo del Toro. And uh, the guy who created uh, Blackish, you know, helped write the script. So, uh, you know, it, 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 I'm actually curious. And there's a third mouse alongside with Luke and Bruno. I mean, I know that Robert Zemeckis in an interview said, we're going to make it as close to the book as possible, but there's some things that is deviating from the book. And it, it actually intrigues me. Oh, and you got to see the, the comments from tell you the, what, Patricia, remind, remind me of the time. Where, remind me of the, where, 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 tell me whereabouts in the story that Chris Rock is in the movie. I mean, sorry, in the, in the story. So, so like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, 
I'm, okay, so uh, from what I understand in an article, I read the Entertainment Weekly article because they were the ones who covered the the, the trailer. Apparently, Chris Rock uh, plays as Luke as an adult. Is that okay? What? Mm. Because you have to hear. You have, okay, so for those uh, who uh, know, but. Uh, Okay. Yeah, and also there's something else as well, which I think might give, may give us a bit of concern. They're not even going to look like they're going to give it like a theatrical release. It looks like it's going to go straight to HBO Max, which is... Well, uh, here's the thing. I mean, we've known for the longest time that this movie was going to be coming out. And we knew that due to the coronavirus, a lot of these movies were not going to be released theatrically. Well, and second, you, baby, you, have, you, have to, uh, you have to call it the Backstreet Boys reunion tour or else YouTube won't give you any money. <laughs> <laughs> oh my... Okay, fair enough. So... Um, knowing that Tenant, which is another movie that was distributed by Warner Brothers that was released theatrically, did not do very well. Warner Brothers was like, oh, crap. Um, we got to release something else to make, make, make for the fact that we didn't make a lot of money with Tenant. Uh, oh, yeah, this, this movie from Robert Zemeckis. Uh, let's, let's release it on HBO Max because streaming services are, you know, making money. So, yeah, I guess that, um, you what, know. What do you think about Tenant at the moment? Apparently it's doing well in Asian markets. I, I wouldn't be surprised because I know that Asia has gotten a, a handle with the coronavirus a lot better than the U.S. But still, nonetheless, you know, for an American market, um, and especially with the whole news reports about like movie theaters are shutting down left and right, they're like, yeah, we, we need to put this out on streaming, which is actually interesting because if you remember a few months ago, we read that it was going to be delayed until 2021. And we're like, OK, so we're going to have to cover this last. But no, it's coming out in a few weeks. Yeah. So that which, means- which kind of concerns me a bit because it's like, you know, uh, the new Bond movie is going gonna, to is gonna, gonna be put off until next year, which makes you think, you know, uh, wouldn't uh, Warner Brothers also be kind of like wondering about the same thing if they think what they have there was actually going to make any money. You know, like, uh, yeah, so uh, the fact that it's going to go straight to streaming is uh, a little bit concerning for me, a little bit. Like, it'll make me wonder, like, are we, well, when we go and see this movie, like, when it finally gets released, I mean, uh, are we looking at something that's going to be of quality here, or are we looking at something here that, uh, you know, the well, everyone sort of look at and thought, yeah, let's just put this on streaming, let's just see how it goes. Oh, no, they're going to do the same treatment that they did with the Crudes A New Age. <laughs> well, yeah. The, and, uh, the but, thing about Tenet is, from what I heard, it only got released in theaters because Christopher Nolan demanded it, basically. Oh, God, really? And he has a lot of pull. So, mm-hmm. Well, uh, Christopher Nolan is not a salesman, let me just tell you that. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. And I think you'll... Uh, but mind you, like, uh, who knows at this point, like... Um, if uh, may hopefully Christopher Nolan will probably take a look at this and think, uh, "Oh, hey, this hasn't worked out so well." But uh, unless I unless I fly to Japan, you know. Yeah, that's true. But uh, anyway, uh, c- continue, Eli. It's it's uh, yeah. I was I have seen all of the tra- the articles and trailers for the new witches movie, and as someone who was familiar with the book and really didn't like the first movie adaptation for a lot of the same reasons that you guys probably listed. But the thing, but the thing is I have a lot of faith in Guillermo del Toro to get this right. Even as weird as the changes they made were. So here's hoping that this will be at least, this will at least be a better version of the book than the first one. Do do you know what I'd like to see in the new movie? Like at the very end, obviously they acquire like the whole book of like all the witches across the world of like, and they basically have to go hunt them down and find, you know, find each or every one of them. And uh, I'd like to see that. You know, like that would be so like, good. Yeah. A massive witch hunt. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, they literally like. I mean, like it's like maybe it's like a, I don't know. Maybe you know if they if they have to like ship in like any like particular products or anything like that. Maybe they can, like, like I don't know if it's gonna be a Samsung laptop or an Apple book or whatever. You know, like uh, they acquire that from the Grand High Witch and it's like, oh, look at this database. This is every single witch across the world. We have to combine these people, and that basically ends up being kind of like you know the montage, like the ends out the movie. I mean, that'd be kind of cool. And then you see, like, all these ways of, like, they get rid of all the witches, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, from the fact that Chris Rock is an adult narrating about his life, that makes me wonder, okay, so is if it's either one of two reasons. They're going to not have Luke stay as a mouse for the rest of his life, or... Luke is as a mouse. And, you know, as you guys know, you know, mice live up to nine years and, you know, they age really quick and rapidly. So maybe they'll have like that final scene in which when, you know, Luke and the grandmother are dying together because they're going to be roughly the same age. And they're like, you know, we'll, we'll live through this together. We'll live our last years together. So 
maybe they'll do that ending because, as you guys know, the original I, they I were going to do the original the, ending. This is a worry for me in regards to Chris Rock because I I can't see him doing this, but I hope he kind of like puts some kind of like, um, you know. I hope he plays the character is like, you know, I accept myself as a mouse and, uh, you know, I, I take it with some kind of like, uh, you know, dignity, I guess you could say, you know, I could just see him just doing like loads and I could just see him do stand up with it, you know, just making loads of really, really awful mouse puns, you know, like, uh, oh God, I, know, I, hope it's not. Like, I, I hope not either, you know, like, you know, I, I, I like I'm Chris just... Rock when he does stand up, you know, please don't make him tell really awful jokes in this movie, please. Well, he's just the narrator, so he's not, like, the main focus of the movie. Remember, it's, like, you know, we have this kid. Uh, I don't even know who he is. is I, I don't know if he's a new actor, but I but he did a pretty good job. And uh, the transformation of him as a mouse is amazing. Like, wow. And well, um, I, I just hope that Guillermo they do. Guillermo del Toro for you. Yeah, I know. Guillermo del Toro just beautiful and i just hope that they do bruno better like come on i'm so sick and tired of seeing the augustus gloop clone change him up mm. anyway yeah. so now i'm kind yeah. of picturing now i'm kind of picturing everybody hates chris but with a mouse <laughs> <laughs> yes oh yeah oh my god that, that'd be awesome Anyway, so um, we're way off topic, but, you know, I, I guess I'll just give my final thoughts. So uh, Revolting Rhymes. It, I don't think it's going to be, like, right up there with the others, like the BFG, James and the Giant Peach, or Fantastic Mr. Fox. But I do see that they did put a lot of heart and soul into this. I love the animation. I like the characters. I like the music. Um, the storytelling could have been a little bit better, but the fact that they were able to compile five different stories that didn't exactly fit into a one cohesive plot is pretty admirable. I would say that, um, you know, for those who uh, can, you know, give it a watch. If, you know, for us Americans, part one is on YouTube. And part two, you'll have to scrounge around for it somewhere because once again, it is released on DVD and I'm sure a lot of streaming service in the UK, but... You know, you'll have to get a Region 2 DVD and, you know, get a streaming service to switch it over to a VPN account if you want to be able to watch it. So, yeah, definitely give this a shot. And uh, before we conclude, I am going to be posting up a poll. That's right. We're going to be doing this a little bit early. Uh, for those who have been tuning into Picks, Picks, and Dream Machine, Aaron and I like to post up a poll, and you guys get to rank on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the lowest and 10 being the highest. What have been your favorite Roald Dahl adaptations? Um, everything is in chronological order. So we have starting off with 36 Hours, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, um, Danny the Champion of the World, Breaking Point, The BFG, The Witches, Four Rooms, James and the Giant Peach, um, Roald Dahl's Little Red Riding Hood, Matilda, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Fantastic Mr. Fox, SEO Trot, and Revol Revolting Rhymes and the movie we're going to be talking about next time. So uh, we're going to post it up early because, as you know, we mentioned before, uh, every single time that we post up a poll and you guys have to put in your ranks, for some reason, at the last minute is when you post up your ranks. Like, as we mentioned in Dream Machine, it, you know, Boss Baby was considered to be the worst DreamWorks movie, according to you guys. But then at last minute, you guys ranked as... Shark Tale being the worst movie. So I'm going to give you guys a break. So in the comments, uh, so in the description box below, there will be a poll for you guys to vote on your favorite and least favorite. And we'll be doing that um, around January because uh, I was going to originally do it around December, but then the announcement of The Witches came out. And we're like, now we need to watch that movie and then we'll need to look back on everything else. And the next adaptation for the longest time will be the... Uh, it's either going to be either the two animated series by Taika Waititi or it's going to be the Matilda, um, you know, uh, musical movie. So I don't know which one's going to be coming first, but yeah, once again, leave your uh, leave your uh, leave your um, ranks in the poll and we'll, you know, go through the results around January. So that's it, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Tune in next time as we're going to be talking about... Tom and Jerry, Willy Wonka, and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, boy. God, God help us. God can't help you now. <laughs> <sighs> All right. 
until then, hope to see you in the next one, guys. Take, Take care, care, everybody. Bye. Bye. See ya.